Broadcasting from Silicon Valley, California, this is Conversations with Jenny Lynn. Thank you for watching Conversations with Jenny Lynn. Today, I am thrilled, happy, excited, all of the great adjectives that can come to your mind. I'm experiencing them now because my guest is fascinating for many reasons. And you will find out what those are as we continue with this interview. He is South African. He is Professor Mark Solms. He's a psychoanalyst and a neuropsychologist. He has published over 350 papers, probably written more than eight books and is learned and full of information that I think you all want to learn about. And so today we are going to hopefully discuss the source of consciousness and anything else that comes along during the time that I'm spending with him. Welcome to my show, Professor Solms. Thank you, it's a very great pleasure to be here. Well, I stumbled upon your work and I thought, oh my goodness, I want to meet this gentleman and I want to share him with my viewers. And I am so grateful that you had the time to spare. You're currently in South Africa, That's cor am I correct? Yes, that's where I am now. I'm at home uh, in my study, at my library, as you call it in the States. I can see it. And it's quite a library for being at home. This, it says a lot, right? So, but you also, you work in London, don't you? Yes, I, I lived in London for 14 years, in fact. Um, and those were the formative years of my scientific life. So I have many close collaborations with colleagues in London. So I spend a good deal of my time there, yes. And I've done my research. So I know kind of what kickstarted you on, on this, but in this particular field of work, because you told the story about yourself and your little brother. But my viewers may not know that story. Do you mind sharing that first before we get into what you do? Yes, sure. Well, um, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's a rather uh, sad story. My, my brother, when he was six years old, um, he was playing on the roof of a building um, and tripped and fell from the roof three floors down and fractured his skull um, and sustained an intracerebral hemorrhage, um, which could have killed him, uh, but he luckily survived. However, as a result of the, the damage that he suffered, uh, he, was, he was permanently changed as a person. And it was a deeply disturbing, of course, distressing uh, event for anyone uh, to go through or to witness or to be the member of a family that, that suffers such a thing. But what, 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 what uh, perplexed and, and, and uh, concerned me the most was how he still looked the same but he was not the same. He was no longer the same person. And uh, I, that, that got me thinking from a young age, uh, you know, how can it be that my brother is the same thing as his brain? You know, how, how can just the damage to a part of your body uh, make you no longer the same person? Where has the previous version of him gone to? You know, and who is this guy? Um, and where did he come from? You know, those sorts of childish questions uh, I'm quite certain were the origin of um, my interest in the brain and why I studied uh, in the fields that I did. Is your brother still around? Yes, he is. Uh, he's had a hard life, uh, but uh, it's better than no life by a long shot. Of course. I'm so sorry to hear that. You know, I, I know of a, another person I was watching. He was a very famous musician from an Australian band and there were similar reports that he had an accident on a motorcycle and was never the same after that. Mm. So because of what happened to your brother, you became curious about the brain and how it, and you wanted to find out how it plays a part in the people that we are apart from our basic functions. Is that correct? Yes, um, that, that, that's exactly correct. I. Um... You know, I, I, 
it's hard to, you know, we, I think we underestimate children generally. Uh, children ask probing questions. Um, and I certainly, despite my, my young age, um, I, I, I just could not get my head around it, if you'll excuse the pun. I couldn't get my head around, you know, how, how can it be that just because he suffered damage to a part of his body, uh, he's, he's changed, he's not the same, he's, he's not the same person. How can I, uh, by uh, analogy, how come I am just, just a bodily organ? Um, and if I am, then, you know, what's going to become of me when my body dies? These sorts of major questions. Uh, I, I think that most children or many children think about these things, but I think I just had a earlier and more kind of um, forceful introduction to, to the problem. And so um, you have learned a lot since then. And so I am going to let you take me in the direction that you think would be a great intro because it's quite, it's a vast, I've looked at so much of your information that I thought I'd let you decide where we go on this first interview. Well, yes, it is a vast, uh, a vast uh, field. So uh, I can understand uh, uh, why you find it daunting. I'll, I'll do my best to summarize things. Um, but remember, I'm summarizing them. So uh, I'm saying many things uh, sort of um, dogmatically behind which there's a lot of evidence. So you must take me back to any of those things that you want me to uh, explicate the evidence. I'd be very glad to do that. But I'll try and give you an overview. Before so, you get started, can I ask you this? Most of the organs in our bodies, when they're damaged, they're repairable. And apparently this is not true of the brain. And if I am correct in, in making this assumption, would you tell us why not? Well, um, it's, not, it's not an absolute uh, fact that the brain is not repairable. Uh, the brain is made of cells like any other organ of the body right. um, and can regenerate. Um, the, the, there are two things about the brain um, which are special. The one is that it's individualized. Um, it's not the brain that you're born with is not the brain that you become. Uh, your, the brain um, is more plastic than any other organ, by which I mean that it alters. It is altered by uh, what, uh, what happens to it. Mm -hmm. um, it. The main function of the brain is to adapt to uh, the circumstances that it finds itself in. And the most... Um, uh, obvious uh, manifestation of this is in the function of memory. Uh -huh. so, uh, if cells are, are killed uh, from trauma or from a stroke or from a tumor or from whatever, uh, you can grow new cells, but they won't be the cells that contain those memories that you had before. Uh, uh -huh. they, they're new cells that have to start the job all over again. So this is why the individual person that you were um, is no longer available even to the extent that you do grow new cells. They connect up in different ways um, and they no longer encode the information that used to be encoded in them. Then there's also the fact that some of those cells perform functions, you know, which some, some parts of the brain, um, very tiny parts of the brain, the size of a match head two cubic millimeters. I know you don't think in millimeters there, but you know the size of a match head. Um, the, 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 there's a part of the brain stem, it's called the parabrachial complex. Okay. Uh, if you damage just that big, two cubic millimeters, it puts you in a coma. Um, you know, so those, those few cells perform such fundamentally important functions um, that the loss of them has catastrophic consequences for the system as a whole. Um, so they do, cells do, de, do regenerate in the brain, but uh, not in the same way as, for example, in the liver, where you just grow new cells and they do the same thing. Um, and so, you know, it's fine. Uh, it, it doesn't work like that in the brain. So is the brain the most complicated organ in our, of our bodies? I think that's safe to say yes. <laughs> I think scientists would disagree with that. Oh, Great. Well, I will let you tell me what you were going to because before I asked you that question, because 
so many people I know who have sustained brain injuries, the common report you hear after is they're not the same. And I've always yes. wondered why, because if we repair, why isn't the person the same? So thank you for clarifying that for me, because that's something I've always wondered about. Um, well, there are many other things I could say about it. Just for example, <clears throat> the formation of scar tissue in the brain, because it functions electrically. Uh, you know, the nerve impulse is an electrical impulse, which then gets converted chemically, and then it's another electric impulse. Um, because of that, the formation of scar tissue can also lead to, to, to simplify it, it can lead to electrical short circuits. And so you have seizure disorders. So the formation of scars, which elsewhere in the body are good things to have, um, in the brain, they, they can cause a great deal um, of trouble. But now, Let's come back to the summary. Um, so when I first studied in this field, which was in the early 1980s, um, I was intrigued by the brain for the very reasons we've just been discussing, because the brain is the person. You know, you are your brain. Um, and so I assumed that by studying neuropsychology, which is the mental aspect of the brain, the subjective aspect of the object uh, that, that we see uh, with our eyes, the being of the brain uh, is what I thought neuropsychology was about, but it's not what it was about. Um, I learned about vision and, and about language and about memory, um, and we were taught what all the mechanisms are whereby information is processed and stored and so on uh, in this organ as if it were no different from any other organ. In other words, we had this third person detached mechanistic account you know, of how the brain processes, let us say, visual information. Right. Uh, it didn't tell us anything about what it is like to see. Um, why do we experience uh, deep blue and deep red? Uh, how does that happen? Uh, there was none of that um, in the neuropsychology that I was taught. So I was very disappointed and frustrated uh, by what, what, uh, what my um, uh, training uh, 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 conveyed to me. Uh, and when I asked my professors, uh, but what about the self? Uh, what about the subject of the brain? What about the feeling of being a brain and so on? They said, don't ask questions like that. They're bad for your career. You know, those are not the kinds of questions that a proper scientist asks. And, um, you know, in truth, I was not interested in building a career. I needed to know the answers to those questions. That's why I was in the field in the first place. So for better or for worse, I never lost my naive, childish um, uh, perplexity ab about the brain. Now, the neuropsychology of the 1980s was all about the cortex. The cortex is that big, uh, curly-whirly stuff, you know, that we normally think of the brain looking like all these convolutions. Um, and that is where the major cognitive functions uh, are uh, uh, performed. And that's what we learned about, as I was saying a moment ago, things like visual perception and language and memory and so on. All of those are cortical functions. Um, but what I learned about those functions told me nothing about what it is like to see or what it is like to remember or what it is like to understand what he said to you, that that, that didn't feature. Um, then in, the, in those two decades, the 1980s and 90s, it increasingly became apparent that in fact, the cortex can perform all of those functions without being conscious at all. Um, and this was uh, really uh, astonishing that you can see without knowing that you're seeing anything. Exactly. You can, without being aware of learning anything. Um, for example, uh, you can, if you flash visual information briefly enough, uh, just for a few milliseconds, as we can do in an instrument called a tachistoscope, uh, you can convey information to the person without them being aware of having seen anything at all. And then you can show subsequently that their behavior is affected by what they saw, even though they're not aware of having seen anything. In other words, they had no conscious experience. And I'm not talking about just crude visual stimuli. I mean, things as complicated as recognizing faces that you don't even know that you've seen before, or associating certain words with those faces, words that you don't know you've read before, 
and you've clearly learned to associate those words with that face and it changes your attitude toward that face when you meet that person uh, subsequently you either like them or you don't like them you just don't know why so we can show that the cortex can perform all of these very complicated higher cognitive functions without being conscious of what it's doing which which made me and not only me made many of us think but if the cortex can do all of this information processing without consciousness then what's the consciousness for it seemed this was why consciousness had no place in what i was taught because it didn't need to be there you know the, 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 this is the the basic conclusion that we were driven to and that led me to a different part of the brain um the cortex which has historically been considered the organ of the mind because it's so uh, it's so important for cognition uh, for cognitive mental functions which we learned don't need to be conscious uh, the it, it led me to a different part of the brain which is in the brain stem uh, and that's the, the the sort of much lower part of the brain just above the spinal cord uh, where we knew since the middle of the last century there are nuclei there which activate the cortex and make it conscious we knew that the cortex could not be conscious unless it's, unless it's activated by the reticular activating system but we thought that was like a power supply you know like electrical socket you got to switch the you got to plug the television set into the wall otherwise it can't do a television thing exactly um, that doesn't that doesn't mean television comes from the power supply you know it just needs to be powered up it's a prerequisite for the television set to work so we thought the cortex was like a television set it needs to be plugged into the brain stem and that powers it up but what happened in the last years of the 20th century and into the beginning of our century uh, we we learned that's not true that the the power supply of the cortex isn't just a power supply uh, it in fact generates a quality and a content of consciousness and that is feelings as we call them in neuroscience raw feelings which are good or bad pleasant or unpleasant so like hunger and thirst and sleepiness um but not only bodily affects but also emotional ones like fear and rage um and say separation distress or you know or whatever all of these feelings these raw basic emotions are generated in the brain stem and i told you i'm going to just summarize so i won't tell you all the evidence for that but if you want me to i'll go back to it uh, that there's really oodles of evidence that the brain stem does not just supply a background uh, wakefulness or a, a level of consciousness um, it's not just a, a a prerequisite it is actually a, a basic form of 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 experience all of its own now if i can just uh, get to the of the matter there what we perceive uh, in our consciousness um visual objects and tactile objects and smells and tastes you know uh, uh, and so on these are the raw ingredients of our perception of the world outside of us and our consciousness is dominated by that stuff but there's something else which is feelings which is not about the objects around us it's about us our own feelings about the things that we experiencing and that's what the brain stem provides so now I, go ahead can i just ask you this so Please. people who suffer from depression and people who have you know fits of rage constantly does does it mean that there's a part of that stem their brain stem that's non-functional or not functioning correctly yes uh, in fact the evidence for that i'll give you just two bits or three bits of evidence for that okay. uh, one the most obvious one is the psychiatric drugs that are given to such patients uh, they manipulate chemicals uh, which are sourced in that very part of the brain i'm talking about so for example antidepressants they act on a chemical called serotonin right serotonin, the source cells for serotonin are in the reticular activating system um anti anxiety drugs that act on norepinephrine uh, the source cells for that neurotransmitter are in the reticular activating system anti psychotic drugs act on dopamine 
uh, which is also sourced in the reticular activating system. So though these, these nuclei in the brain stem broadcast their effects far and wide in the brain, uh, they are sourced in the part of the brain that I'm talking about. So emotional, so drugs which 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 uh, uh, alter your emotional state are acting on the very system that I'm talking about. But another form of evidence for it is if you stimulate electrically those nuclei in the brain stem, you can produce intense emotional states. So in somebody who's never been depressed before, um, you stimulate, for example, the substantia nigra blocking dopamine, and it produces a profound suicidal depression within five seconds. You know, and you switch the stimulus, 90 seconds later, the depression has gone. So you, know, you can cause feelings by stimulating those structures, feelings uh, of the kind that we are talking about. In other words, the kinds of feelings that are the core of what emotional disorders are all about. Also, if you use PET imaging, positron emission tomography, where you image, uh, you, you get a picture of what's going on inside the brain. When somebody is in a depressed state or a fearful state or any basic emotional state, and you look where in the brain is the activation that correlates with that feeling that the patient is suffering from, the activation is in the brain stem. So yes, uh, it, it, suffering emotions um, is suffering uh, the effects of these systems um, that excrete these chemicals that, that, that uh, light up these parts um, on, on functional imaging studies uh, and that you can stimulate electrically to produce those feelings and to switch them off. So for example, uh, two colleagues of mine uh, who I value very much, Helen Mayberg, uh, an American colleague, um, a neurologist, she showed that if you, if you uh, uh, stimulate a part of the brain called the subgenual cingular gyrus, uh, the white matter just under there, you can, in a very depressed patient, patients who've been depressed for years and have not responded to any treatment. That's the only way in which they were able to be enrolled in the study, treatment refractory depression. Mm -hmm. chronic, you put uh, that stimulator into that system which arises from the, from the subcortical structures I'm talking about, and the depression stops within seconds. On the operating table, the patient feels better. Uh, and the same to, uh, applies to a colleague of mine, Filke Kernan, uh, who did the same by stimulating the medial forebrain bundle, again, coming from the reticular activating system. So I'm not saying that these are ideal treatments for psychiatric disorders. I mean, there are all sorts of problems with treatments like that, but they prove the point uh, that these disorders are indeed uh, uh, closely tied to the functioning of the systems I'm talking about. So to return to my summary, so we... We, we, I and my other colleagues who were working along the same lines as me, uh, we we shifted our focus from the cortex down to the brain stem, uh, recognizing that all consciousness comes from there. That's not controversial. Everyone agrees all consciousness comes from there. Uh, it activates the cortex, and that's how the cortex becomes conscious. But uh, that that form of activation is feeling. So feeling is the basic form of consciousness. Now, the structures that we are talking about in the brain stem that produce feelings, they function according to a relatively simple mechanism. That mechanism is called homeostasis. Homeostasis basically works like this, that there are certain uh, parameters that physiological that we have to remain in if we're going to stay alive. So there's a core body temperature you have to remain within the same with how much water is in your body, how much oxygen, how much carbon dioxide, how much salt, how much water, et cetera. Uh, you have to stay within those ranges. If you deviate from that range, it's, it's a danger to your survival. If you go too far out of that range, literally you die. It's actually quite frightening to know that. And so it's in the brain stem that we are monitoring our core body temperature, our hydration, uh, uh, our oxygenation, et cetera. And what... That's so that mechanism of homeostasis, uh, what, how it relates to feeling is that if you deviate too far from where you need to be, it feels bad. 
Uh, so you get hungry or thirsty or you feel suffocation alarm uh, or you feel sleepy or you feel fearful or you feel uh, enraged uh, because emotions are the same. You have to be not in danger from an attacker. If you are, uh, you've moved away from where you need to be. And that feels like fear. Or uh, in the case of anger, you know, you need to be in this range where they are not frustrating, impeding obstacles between you and the things that you want. And if there are things in the way, you get frustrated and irritated and eventually angry. That's what that, the feeling is telling you. You're not where you need to be. Uh, and you need to correct that. So unpleasant feelings tell you you're moving away from your homeostatic set point. Pleasant feelings mean you're moving back. So that's what feelings do, and they guide our behavior. Uh, so you know whether you're doing well or badly in terms of your basic needs um, uh, by dint of how you feel. Right. The feeling mm -hmm. you in relation to all of those different needs, bodily ones and emotional ones, how well or badly you're doing. So that's what feeling is, which is the basic form of consciousness, uh, as I've already explained. Um, now, the fact that you can reduce um, consciousness in its basic form to this simple mechanism of homeostasis, that for me was the major breakthrough uh, which led to this book, that uh, a colleague of mine named Carl Friston, uh, he had reduced to some mathematical equations how homeostasis works. In other words, how those basic brainstem nuclei regulate your bodily needs. And I thought, but if affect is homeostatic too, then it must be possible for us to use the same equations in an extended form to explain how feelings come about in right. terms of the basic laws of you know, how, the causal mechanism whereby feelings are generated. And so that, as I said, is the breakthrough that led to this book uh, and the culmination of the book. It ends, and this part is going to sound weird uh, to, to our audience, uh, but the culmination of the book is that if these really are the mechanisms whereby consciousness is caused and produced, then it should be possible to artificially engineer it. It should be possible for us to produce an artificial, and please note I'm saying artificial, it's not human consciousness, but it should be possible to generate elementary forms of affect, elementary forms of feeling, whereby the artificial system feels its way through a problem. Are things going badly or well for me in terms of my, uh, my attempt to keep on existing? Um, and so that's okay. the journey to the source of consciousness ends in the most unexpected place. And I say unexpected to me myself, because I really was never, I mean, I'm a biologist of the mind. I'm not interested in computers uh, and I've never been interested in artificial intelligence. But in the last few years, my work has led me there. And so currently I'm working with a team of physicists and computer scientists and biomedical engineers where we're trying to see whether we can literally engineer uh, an artificial form of feeling. And uh, that's where the job. That's awesome. Well, Indeed. One thing I, I didn't ask you, and I'm sure you've explained it, but I want to make sure that people understand. How would you define consciousness? Well, part of the problem uh, of, of, of consciousness research is that most of us take our own human experience of consciousness as a kind of starting point, which is reasonable enough. I mean, it's understandable enough this thing that we're experiencing now, this is consciousness. Right. But it's the most complicated form of consciousness that exists in, in the known universe. So in science, you don't start with the most complicated version of a thing. You start with the most basic version of the thing right. if you want to understand how it works. So um, when you say, how would I define consciousness? Most people would define it as this, this thing that we're experiencing now. Uh, but I define it as something far more basic than that, which is just this, the capacity of a system, we are, when I say a system, I mean an organism like ourselves, the capacity of the system to know its own state, uh, to be subjectively, for it to feel like something to be that system. If it feels like something to be that system, then it's a conscious system. So uh, if a computer, if it felt like something to be a computer, 
it would be conscious, but it doesn't feel like something to be a computer, so we don't think of them as conscious. It does feel like something to be you and me, so we are conscious. Um, does it feel like something to be a dog? Uh, most of us who have pet dogs would say, yeah, of course it does. Does it feel like something to be a cat? Uh, what about a rat? Uh, what about a fish? Does yeah. it feel like something to be a fish? Um, and so, you know, the question of which kinds of creatures are conscious, um, the mechanism that we've identified in the brain stem, uh, any creature that has that same anatomy, uh, which does the same thing, uh, there's good reason to believe that that creature is conscious, uh, even though it's nothing like human consciousness. And, and, and the truth is that when it comes to the brain structures I've just been talking about, those reticular activating nuclei in the brain stem, fishes have them. And it's not just enough to say they have them, therefore they're conscious. In science, uh, you, that's an hypothesis. Then you have to test it. So we make falsifiable predictions from that hypothesis. We say, in the human brain, we know if you stimulate this nucleus, it produces this very unpleasant state. If you stimulate that nucleus, it produces this deliciously wonderful state. Oh. I therefore predict that if I stimulate this nucleus in the fish, it's going to be aversive and the fish is going to avoid the stimulus. Whereas if I stimulate that one, the fish is going to fall in love with that stimulus and want <laughs> to be with it all the time. And that's what we then observe. So that confirms the prediction that comes from the hypothesis. And this is just one example. I'll, I'll tell you one more about fishes, just so that you understand what basic thing I'm talking about. Right. When I call it. It's just, does it feel like something to be that thing? Um, fishes, if you put in the tank, fishes are floating about in this tank. I'm using the screen as the tank. Uh, if you put over this corner of the tank, you put cocaine or morphine or nicotine or amphetamine, all these drugs, uh, which are not good for the fish, no more good for the fish than they are for you and me, but they feel good. The <laughs> fishes love to be there. They love to be there where the cocaine is. Um, and so that's strong evidence for the view that fishes feel feelings. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? The fish, they get the effects of it and they recognize it. So yes. they, I wouldn't know if they recognize it. You see, I must, again, because you're asking me the question, what is consciousness? What, yeah. How do we define it? Uh, we human beings, uh, we know I feel like this about that. Uh, that's called cocaine. Uh, yeah. I'm a drug addict. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm attracted to this substance. The yeah. fish doesn't have all those thoughts. It just knows it feels good to be there. It doesn't know why, so it's there. Uh, so this is what I mean by consciousness. It's very simple, raw feeling which is what it is like to be that fish in that state. Amazing. Rocks don't feel like anything. Computers don't feel like anything. Um, flies uh, is questionable. Uh, fishes, I have no doubt they feel like something. Well, and is that because they have a brain? Because a computer has a brain, but it's not a, it's not a, it's a different type of brain. It's like a material. Remember what I said at the very beginning of our conversation when I said yeah. how disappointed I was when I first trained as a neuropsychologist. Uh, we were focusing on the cortex, which does all of this intelligent information processing. It perceives, uh, it remembers, it learns, uh, it makes decisions, uh, just as your computer does, or just as your mobile phone does. You know, phones can recognize faces and they can they can, they, in other words, they can perceive them and recognize them and they can store the information in their memories um, and so on. You know, they're very intelligent, our computers and, and, and telephones nowadays uh, and so on. But that doesn't mean that they feel like anything. So that's the crucial leap that I made early on uh, toward the end of the, of, the, of the 80s and the 90s of last century, was realizing that all of this processing of all of this complicated information. That's not what is the essence of what a mind is. Um, there's plenty of intelligence in computers. In fact, some computers are more intelligent than us uh, in some respects. Like, for example, they beat us at chess. They beat our best human chess players. They beat our best players of the game called Go, which is even more complicated than chess. Um, they, they're more intelligent than us. But there's no reason to believe that they feel like anything uh, because they're not 
They're not systems which are trying to survive, uh, which as I told you, uh, is where feeling arises from this homeostatic mechanism whereby we self-organizing biological systems uh, have an aim and a purpose and a value system. This is crucial. We have a value system, uh, which is, uh, I'm not saying we have to intellectually endorse it, but it is the value system that designed us, which is that it's good to survive and bad not to. And so feelings uh, represent those values. Pleasurable feelings mean, yep, yep, carry on doing this. It enhances your chances of surviving. And bad feelings mean bad news. Don't do this. Uh, it's going to end in tears. It, That's what it, it is fascinating to speak with you. I mean, there's so much. I'm hoping that you will let me do some more segments with you when you have the time. But you referenced artificial intelligence in this conversation. And you said you were avoiding it, but lately you are sort of collaborating. How do you feel based on all of the knowledge you've clearly done an amazing job throughout your lifetime of understanding the brain? How do you feel about what is being done in artificial intelligence um, with the knowledge you have of the brain? Well, up until a few years ago, as I said, I was not that interested or impressed by it because although it's very intelligent, uh, there was no reason to believe that there's a mind there, uh, a mind defined as a conscious agent that feels like something. So, um, you know, although these devices can do all these tricks, um, there's no reason to believe that there's anybody at home, as it were. Um, <laughs> It's only in recent years when we made the advances that I've been describing to you that I became interested in artificial intelligence because I realized that in principle, it is possible to engineer an artificial consciousness. Now that's quite a different thing from an artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, it's also quite a worrying possibility because it has all sorts of ethical um, uh, uh, implications, both for us, uh, Imagine, I've already told you that there are now computers that are more intelligent than us in some respects. Right. Imagine if those computers which are more intelligent than us uh, are also trying to do whatever they have to do to survive. Now, what if what they need to do to survive is to get rid of us? You know, this is what I mean by ethical implications. You know, we really thought about that. Yeah. And it's also, we need also to think about it ethically from the point of view of the computer. If the computer has feelings, uh, if a robot feels like something, then you've got to think about what is ethically appropriate in terms of the way you behave towards that robot. Uh, we are happy to have robots building cars and so on. Uh, they're basically slaves, but it doesn't matter because they don't feel like anything. If they do feel like something, they are literally slaves. You know, And so you need to also think about what is ethical from the point of view of a sentient, of a feeling robot? So, so you know, we are, we are proceeding a pace in this area, uh, but I also think that we need to proceed with extreme caution. I agree with you 100%. Um, you know, it's amazing what, what we are experiencing in our lifetime. I mean, what you have researched with the brain, we've come into these lives with these brains, but all the other stuff, the AI and all the technology that's in the world today, to me behind it all is still a brain because the person creating it had to have and has been using their brain to its full potential to be able to come up with these things that are serving us or not. So one thing I wanted to remark before we wrap this up is I think you would be the best friend anybody could have or husband or whatever, because I think you understand humans more than most people. And when you encounter certain behaviors with them, are you able to have compassion because you can pretty much understand where they're coming from? Well, I, I think that uh, ultimately at bottom, and look, let's not be too reductionistic about it, but ultimately at bottom, we human beings are just a species of animal. 
you know, as, as shocking as it is to our own self-concept, clearly we're embodied creatures um, and we live and we die, you know, and the, there are evolutionarily uh, 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 given mechanisms that govern the way that we function. And I've told you that at the heart of that, as far as the brain is concerned, and the brain is kind of like the head office, again, excuse the pun, it's the head office of the body. Um, it's where everything else is orchestrated. Um, it, it functions homeostatically. In other words, it's trying to keep us within our preferred ranges, within our viable ranges. And I've told you those are not just bodily states, they're also emotional states. So when you say, do I understand something about what it is to be human? No, I, I understand it ultimately in these terms, that what all of us are doing is trying to meet our needs. Um, and those are not just bodily needs, they're also emotional needs. Understanding what the emotional needs of the human brain are is a very important task for science. Uh, because these are the basic values. I said earlier our values are to survive, uh, but there are multiple subcategories of that. Um, you know, so we need to escape dangers, we need to get rid of frustrating obstacles, uh, but we also have lustful feelings, we also have attachment feelings, we also have playful feelings. Did you know human beings, in fact all mammals, they have a need to play? You look at any juvenile mammal, like any kid, they play all the time. Why? You know, what's that all about? All of it is about these basic homeostatic mechanisms, understanding what those are about is profoundly important for humanity and for each and every one of us, because what, what our lives are about are feelings. Feelings announce whether or not we're meeting our needs uh, and knowing what those different needs are uh, is to know something profoundly important about what it is to live a good life. When a person is at play, does that mean that the brain is in a relaxed state? How do you explain what do you or can you explain what is going on in the brain when the person is having a pleasurable experience or they're playing? So um, there are many different types of pleasure in the brain. Um, and this is what I was just speaking about. There's not a thing called pleasure, although there is a common denominator, which is unpleasure or, 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 or uh, unpleasant feelings mean you're moving away from where you need to be in terms of one of your basic needs, including emotional needs. Pleasant feelings mean you're moving back to where you need to be. So that's the common denominator. Unpleasure means you're going the wrong way. Pleasure means you're going the right way. Right. Uh, and that's what the feelings are for. But then there are many different types of pleasure. So the pleasure of, a, of, of, of satisfying your hunger is different from the pleasure of um, voiding your bladder when it's too full. You know, it's a, a very different feeling. Uh, and the pleasure of um, uh, escaping a danger or the pleasure of establishing reunion with somebody you love, uh, these are, each of them has a very different quality. And so the qualities of the different types of pleasure uh, announce which of the needs uh, 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 you, you're, you're, you're currently either satisfying or failing to satisfy. Now, play is just one of those needs. And the quality of pleasure uh, that comes with play is called fun. Fun is very different from eating chocolate or, or, from, or from an orgasm. You know? these, are, these are different uh, 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 categories of pleasure. So you ask any child, what's, the fa what's your favorite thing to do? They say, play. You, know, you say, why? They say, because it's fun. Uh, then starts the scientific question, why? Why should it be so much fun to do this ridiculous yeah. thing called playing? Because it's not obvious at all why this is good for our species. But we need to play. In fact, um, if you deprive a juvenile mammal of half an hour's play today, it will try to make up half an hour's more play tomorrow. Uh, this is what I mean by a need. Um, and so the science begins there in us probing, why do we need to play? What does it do? Why is it so important? Why has evolution made it so pleasurable uh, to, to participate in this kind of activity, which seems so pointless? Um, you know, kids chasing each other and jumping on top of each other and rolling about and so on. Kids do it, dogs do it, cats do it, squirrels do it, dolphins do it, you know, all mammals do it. Um, and so the, the study of the brain mechanism of this 
has taught us some incredibly interesting things about what it is to be human. Uh, but as you say, we are going to have to have more conversations than this one uh, if we're going to plow through all of those details. Yes, it's so vast and you've done so much research. Um, we are almost out of time and I don't, I know you've had a long day, this is your evening. Uh, and so I don't want to be um, greedy and take more time than you have to offer me. What would you like to leave with my viewers before I wrap this segment up? What is the key well, message you want to leave with them? Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry to say that the thing I would like to leave with your viewers is that the topic that we're discussing is so vast that it's not possible to pack it into 45 minutes. So I recommend you read my book. That's the thing I would leave yes, you with. Please tell them, tell them where, where they can find uh, your the book. book. The book, uh, the title of my book is The Hidden Spring, The Hidden Spring, and its subtitle is A Journey to the Source of Consciousness, and it's published by Norton uh, in New York. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's written for uh, everybody. I'm, I've tried my hardest to not make it too jargony and not make it too technical, but some of the things uh, that we are having to grapple with are difficult. Uh, you know, Einstein famously said that in science, we must simplify as much as possible, but no more than that. <laughs> so uh, I'm trying to not, oversimplify, but I, 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 I uh, have tried my hardest to make uh, what we've learned. It's so fascinating. I, I don't know why anybody does anything else with their life than study the brain. Uh, it's the most interesting thing imaginable. Uh, it's, 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 it's so fascinating. It's, it, it drives, um, it, I hope, the reader uh, through all of the difficult chapters um, to, to getting to the end, uh, because it's it's certainly a journey worth, worth uh, taking. And it sounds like you empower yourself when you learn about the functions and the abilities of your brain. Because someone told me once that a lot of people die and they don't even use 10% of their brain. Well, certainly uh, because you are your brain, uh, it's something worth getting to know how it works. <laughs> I agree with you. Thank you. So can, if you have more information, you like my guests, my viewers, how can they, you've written eight books. You gave us the name of one. How can they yes. get a hold of your other books? Um, well, this book is the first book that's written for, for, for everybody. It's written, my, my other books, apart from one of them, I'll, which I'll mention in a moment, all the others are really technical books written for my colleagues. They're scientific books. Uh, I mean, like hard scientific books. Um, although some of them are in interesting topics, like one of the first books I published was on how the brain makes dreams, you know, how, how, the, the, how dreams are generated by the brain. So that's interesting, but it's written for neuroscientists. The only other book that I've published, which is written for everybody, uh, is called The Brain and the Inner World. Um, and it's a sort of an introduction to the neuroscience of subjective experience. Uh, but, but I published that, gosh, it was about 20 years ago now, The Brain in the Inner World. Um, so I recommend if you, want to, um, if you want to be up to date with the ex most exciting things we've learned about this field in recent times, uh, I would recommend uh, my book, The Hidden Spring. The Hidden Spring. Yes. And I would like to, um, on this segment, ask you if we could do another segment whenever you can soon to talk about the dream, the brain and dreams, because okay. I am someone who gets many, many premonitions in my dreams. And since I was five years old, I've had this. And it's gotten more intense as I've gotten older. So much so that if I call my kids too early in the morning, they always ask me, mom, what did you dream? Well, um, uh, anybody who reads my current book will, will understand something immediately of why that is the case, because uh, the brain is a prediction machine. The main thing that it's doing is trying to foretell the future. Uh, memory is about the past. It's about the past, but it's for the future. Uh, the whole point of learning from experience is to learn how to predict on the basis of what happened previously, what is likely to happen in future. So the brain is a prediction machine. 
Um, and so the fact that the brain generates dreams, uh, which are predictions, uh, is not a great surprise. Fascinating. You are fascinating. I am so grateful to you, not only for your time, for, but for the years of all the work and your dedication to you know, doing the research and educating us and bringing to our consciousness the importance. We know the brain is a delicate organ and we know that we, will, we won't function if our brain dies, but it's so wonderful that you have such a love and your passion. I can feel it for your field of work. And so I'm sorry that it started from a sad experience but I'm really happy that you've spent the time doing it. And I can't wait to invite you back again so you can educate us further. I will put the name of your book on the video so people won't forget and they will know where to find it. Thanks, gentlemen. It's really been a great pleasure talking to you. Oh my gosh, it has been a tremendous pleasure for me to speak with you. And I thank you so much for watching Conversations with Jenny Lynn. I always look for the most fascinating people I can find. And without a doubt, Professor Psalms is definitely one of them. I'm sure you're smarter for watching this interview. And I'm looking forward to bringing him back to share him with you again very soon. And I will see you next time. Thank you. Broadcasting from Silicon Valley, California, this is Conversations with Jenny Lynn. Watching Conversations with Jenny Lynn, formerly known as The Jenny Lynn Show. And as always, I bring you fascinating people with fascinating stories. At least I tried to, and I have in the past, and today is no exception. My guest, Brandon Watkins, is a Stanford University Children's Hospital employee who has just done something phenomenal for the hospital. And I can't wait for him to tell you about it. Brandon? Nice to meet you, Jenny Wen. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this um, wonderful endeavor of yours with us. I saw you made the newspaper, so I thought I better go get that story. <laughs> so tell me. What, what did you do? So um, I decided to run a marathon on each of the seven continents plus New Zealand because uh, some people consider New Zealand to be the eighth continent. So I decided to, to start in New Zealand and go from there to Australia to Singapore to Cairo to 